It is a pleasant afternoon from the ZN studios right here in Harare, Zimbabwe. I'm Ndaka Jaka. In this Mint Special, we will discuss women's economic empowerment and care, specifically unpaid care work. Now, care work, which is predominantly provided for by women and girls, is a central yet typically undervalued contributor to economies. It includes supporting daily activities of individuals, such as cooking, cleaning, and providing daily essentials, as well as the health and well-being of others, including children and the elderly. Now, there is not a single country in this world where men and women do an equal amount of care work. Estimates show that globally women do 2.5 times more care work than men. And in countries where care burden is unequal, like Zimbabwe, this amounts to women spending 10 or more weeks per year on unpaid care compared to men. The issue of unpaid care work and specifically its unequal distribution is a major barrier to women's economic empowerment, achieving gender equality as well as development more broadly. Now it is in this light that Oxfam in Zimbabwe under the project Women's Economic Empowerment and Care is running a campaign called the How I Care campaign in partnership with the Badare Enkundleni Men's Forum. Now the the campaign aims at shaping gender norms that prevent men from assuming equal care responsibilities and challenging existing negative social norms by encouraging males to be involved in care responsibilities at the household level. This broadcast is brought to you by Zim Papers TV Network and our partners Oxfam Zimbabwe. Joining us on our show today to discuss the dynamics of unpaid care work are Oxfam Social Norms Advisor Regis Mtutu as well as Zimbabwe Gender Commission Chief Executive Virginia Mwanigwa. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Now, ma'am, I'm going to start with you. As the Gender Commission of Zimbabwe, would you please give our viewers an appraisal of the unpaid care work situation in Zimbabwe at this particular moment? Okay. And um, thank you very much, Ndaka. In terms of giving an appraisal, I'm assuming that we're going to speak from the perspective of being under the COVID-19 pandemic, where just by the nature of the pandemic and what it has meant for people in Zimbabwe, we definitely know that unpaid care work is a bit more than it would have been for the women, for particularly the women that uh, functionally in society are actually given the work of doing the unpaid care work. So you find that because now under the lockdown particularly, but even outside of the lockdown, the work that women have always done will continue to be done. The only difference is that now you're doing that where usually maybe half of the people in your household are at work, whether vending on the streets of Harare or wherever that they work. Now under the lockdown, they are all in the house. And what this basically means is if you're washing, if you're cooking, if you're looking or if you're tending to whatever needs to be tended to, now there, there's a higher population of people that you, you're working for. So we have found, as the Zimbabwe Gender Commission, we've been monitoring the gender impact of COVID from a perspective of what does it mean in terms of the informal economy is not working, what does it mean in terms of food and nutrition? What does it mean in terms of just access to information, in terms of even gender-based violence? And some of the information that we got was that because people are not going out to work, so you'll find that there are a lot of people that are in the household at home, very stressed, because if I usually spend my days selling my tomatoes, selling my onions, doing whatever I do, kumbari msika, now I'm actually stuck at home. So... There is definitely a lot of unpaid care work that is there. Mm -hmm. Apart from the fact that in the event that uh, one of the members of the household gets sick, because part of the care work is also tending to those that are ill, so in the event that somebody is sick, and remember we're not just talking about being sick from COVID, you still have those that get malaria, you still have those that get diarrhea, whatever other sicknesses that we have. They'll be there, except now you don't usually have the ability to run off to the nearest clinic as easily as you would do. Or people are not being admitted maybe the same way that they were being admitted if we didn't have COVID. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much.
Right, I will come to you, Regis. As Oxfam, since 2014, you've been running the How Do I Care campaign, specifically targeted at empowering women who are disenfranchised because of unpaid care work. Can you please just give us an update of what Oxfam has done so far? Um, as you say, the project started in 2014, and we're working in uh, four districts across Zimbabwe, in Kutu District, Mashingo, um, Shishavane and Gubi in Matibele in the north. Um, as we do this care work, we have a framework that we think can help address the problem that Virginia has adequately outlined. Basically, the framework is the four hours. We seek, we seek to redistribute the work, that it share it between men and women, boys and girls. We seek to reduce the burden uh, that women face, reducing the long distances if it's in a rural area where they walk up to five kilometers to fetch water and firewood. In the urban areas, we know that the queue for water, some wake up as early as 3 a.m., so we want to reduce the load. We also are talking about um, representation, where we are saying we will represent the care workers. Um, I'm sure over the next, as we have this series of talks, we shall bring the care workers so that they have a voice they speak for themselves. But more importantly, part of the representation is that we want to take this discussion beyond the household level. There's also policy issues around unpaid care work, and we are calling on government to actually begin to see this as a development issue, to begin to see this as an economic issue. And lastly, we are also talking about, I've talked about representation, redistribution, reduction. Um, so this is the framework we're using. And so what we've done in terms of reduction, we've put in piped water schemes in villages in the rural area so that any woman can just walk from her hut, go five meters, ten meters, and open the tap and get water. And we know with the difficulties that we are having here in the urban centers, we've also put in piped water schemes where we have a, quite a number of water points. So it means that women don't have to queue at one water point but they've also uh, several water points that they can queue and so reduce the time that they queue for, the, for water. In addition, we've come up with a new innovation, what we are calling the water kiosk, where communities can put load money into a card and then they go and just also get water without actually having to queue because you go at different times. In terms of redistribution, we are working with what we are called care champions, who are mostly men but also a female care champions who then go door to door in the suburbs of Headcliffe, Budiriro, and Glenview, where they actually engage households to actually say, talk about the frameworks that I've talked about, and actually engage men around helping. And we are beginning to see some emerging changes where men are actually going to fetch water, where men are actually helping. But um, we have seen that, as Virginia said, with COVID it has actually increased the workload. But interestingly, it has also opened up the eyes of men to actually what happens when they spend time at home. We've just completed a survey in Glenview, Budiru and Heathcliff around the impact of um, uh, COVID on unpaid care work. And interestingly, uh, it shows that uh, there's been a marginal increase in men doing some of the care tasks. And so what it tells us is that if men stay at home, they can actually do a lot more of um, care work. So around Father's Day, that's when we launched this How I Care campaign, and we're asking men to actually tell us their experiences around how they care, what is it that they've done. Uh, but the challenge that still remains, like I said, we've seen that if men are at home, they do a lot more. So how do we make men stay more at home? So I think that's the next challenge when we are doing our social norms work to actually look at ways in which we can encourage men to spend more time at home, to spend more time in dialogue with their children, with their spouses, and actually help out around um, where they're working. And the last point I want to make is that um, as part of this series of talk shows, we shall actually engage the Minister of Energy and Power Development. We shall, involve, we shall engage um, female MPs and also male MPs as well as the Minister of Energy. Basically, we are also saying to government, what is it that they can do in terms of changing policy so that it addresses the reduction, the representation, and the redistribution. So um, we hope that um, we are able to present data to government like the data that you were showing that um, 
uh, women spend so much time, but if we reduce, then they have more time, then they can do activities of their choice. But also, it opens up the possibilities that they can be involved in economic empowerment. And what does that do? We have to show that it increases the GDP of Zimbabwe. But we also want to start engaging other very key stakeholders, such as the Zimbabwe Statistical Office, to actually do time service to find out how women and men spend their time and how that time can be channeled into productive activities. Oh, of course, that brings us to target 5.4 of the SDGs, mm. which speaks to the issue of uh, unpaid care work and the steps that countries mm. need to take mm. as they try to eradicate mm. this uh, burden. I'll come to you, ma'am. Mm. He spoke about the time use surveys. The, mm. the SDGs uh, say that is uh, stage one mm. of uh, trying to eradicate and uh, the problem of unpaid care work. Mm. Countries must take part or must conduct time use surveys. Mm. Interestingly, only about um, 83 countries have have conducted time use surveys so far. Mm -hmm. Has Zimbabwe conducted anything along these lines yet? I, I know that it's definitely a discussion that has been had in terms of time use surveys. And I think under the Zimstats, they've been, time use has been one of the indicators that was looked at. But uh, for me, in terms of, for, for us to then get to a point where the studies would be done in a concerted manner, we need to recognize, this is the other R, recognize care work. Mm -hmm. Because I come from a situation where back in the 90s when I started working, you used to hear a statement that used to say women don't work. And that basically meant that whatever work that the women would be doing at home is not considered as work. So this is very important that we start to recognize that work. And just now that I also started working formally, I know that one of the most tiring times that I have is when I spend my day at home and then I have to do the housework because it's very tiring. And it looks like, I think, it, it, the way we are socialized as people, the work will be done right under our nose, but we may not recognize it as work. So you see that uh, the food is being put on the table, the clothes are being washed, the children are being cleaned, the yard is clean, everything. But it's so seamlessly done, because again, that is part of the socialization, that people may not recognize that it is work. So the issue of recognizing it is very important. And definitely time use surveys are important, because what those will do is to show the extent to which people, whether men or women, who are actually engaged in care work, put so much more time than even the nine to five jobs that are already recognized as work. Mm -hmm. I think if the ministry was here, they would be adequately capacitated to say to what extent the time use surveys are there. But I know that there's been some researches where time use surveys have been some of the areas that we've been looked at. Mm -hmm. Whether it was an individual research on time use is another matter. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. just, uh, the IEA says that uh, the issue that which you were talking about of reducing hazardous tasks uh, could yeah. save the globe at least a hundred billion hours if all countries made an effort to reduce hazardous uh, hazardous environments whereby where women work, for example, going to look for firewood, for example, going to fetch uh, water yeah. over long distances. And as Oxfam, you've already covered this. But wha what I understand is that the women in rural areas suffer the most from this burden because they're the ones who have to go and fetch water over two kilometer periods. Uh, in urban areas, people just have taps. Of course, there's also the issue of water shortages in, in urban areas, which will come a bit later, but as Oxfam, which rural areas have you targeted and what are some of the quantifiable results that you've achieved? Um, we have worked in Kutu district, like I said, Mashingo, Shabana and Gubi, and um, in all those districts we have put in um, the piped water scheme in terms of reduction. And what it has shown, it has shown that um, for most women, uh, on average, they are spending four hours less on fetching water and firewood. And that has actually led them to have more time. Um, and this has to be viewed from two points. Um, the one point which we still need to work around is that if they have more time, uh, the social expectation is that um, they should not rest. Uh, I remember in one focus group discussion, one woman said, you know, so even if we create more time, 
we actually have to work around that. Women realize that this is the time they could use for self-care. Mm -hmm. This is the time that they can use for economic empowerment. But it is one area that way we have to work. And then secondly, um, the time that they've saved, um, is since water is readily available and it's not very far and it's within um, their home states or within a short walking distance, they've started um, various economic projects, particularly around uh, horticulture and market gardening. And they are actually, first and foremost, their food security has improved. It means that they are able to what? To feed themselves and their family. And secondly, they have a surplus that they can then supply the nearest town of Sishabane, Bulawai, and Masingo, Eben. But more importantly, the women on their own have come up with a system where they said, in case something goes wrong with our pipe daughter scheme, at that time they were, I think, putting aside the equivalent of um, one US dollar per month, right? And they've built up a pot of fund, and they saw that the man was just sitting there. Then after three months, they said to themselves, those who want to borrow can come and borrow. So they tell us we are able to pay school fees. We don't have difficulties when our children are sick. We have some way we can get. So that has also led to economic activities that were not originally part of the project. Right. So uh, it, opens, really it opens so many possibilities mm -hmm. when women have more time on their hands when women are able to actually think around what else they can do in terms of economic empowerment. Yes, I love to just uh, cut you off right there as you're explaining to us that uh, the more time they have, uh, the better they are to empower themselves economically. We'll now take a short breather. The current position is that the burden of unpaid care work limits women's and girls' opportunities for education, employment, as well as participation in political aspects. When we come back, we'll continue interrogating the issue of unpaid care work Work, as our panelists explain how they are in their various capacities crafting mechanisms for greater participation of women in education, work and public life for girls and women in Zimbabwe. Coronavirus is a threat to all humanity. It has killed over 350,000 people so far, and many others are in quarantine away from their loved ones. We are fortunate to be alive, but no one knows how and when the virus will strike closer to home. You and I are each other's keeper. With winter upon us, let's ensure that none of us will be exposed to the elements that make us vulnerable to COVID-19. Let's help those in need by contributing to the Zimpapers COVID-19 fund. The proceeds will go towards equipping underdeveloped health centers and communities. To contribute, dial or SMS the following numbers on your screen. Remember, if we stand together, we win together. Thank you so much for staying with us. This broadcast is brought to you by Zimpapers TV Network and our partners, Ox Firm Zimbabwe. Now, Virginia, mm. I'll come to you. Mm. Is the commission, what is some of the work that you're doing in terms of uh, women and economic empowerment? Okay, so I'll start with the, the work that the commission does in general and then come down to the women and the economy. So part of the mandate that we have as the commission is to monitor gender equality and see to what extent gender equality is a reality for the men, women, boys and girls of Zimbabwe. And when we're talking about gender equality, we're also talking about women's representation in politics and decision making. I'm going to look at the area of decision making as it pertains to the economy. Regis already spoke about representation as one of the R's 
that we look at in terms of the unpaid care work. So it's very important that women are also represented in whatever structures, decision making or otherwise, that discuss issues of the economy. Because if we don't have a representation of women there, it means those that come to the table will speak from their experiences. And if you have not done or if you're not in the habit of doing uncared pay work, you may forget it. Remember when I started, I said the issue of recognizing the existence of care work is very important. Mm -hmm. Because I, I remember back in, in, in university that we were talking about having a dual economy. Dual economy means that the unpaid care work actually subsidizes the paid care work. You're able to come out and go to work every day because somebody takes care of your house, somebody washes your clothes for you to look very clean at work. So, and unfortunately, while the formal economy is recognized in terms of policy, the unpaid care work is starting to be recognized now because of the campaign, one of which is what Oxfam is talking about. Mm -hmm. So it's important that that is always known that as long as representation does not include those people that leave that situation. It means whatever policies you come up with will not rep represent that. As the Zimbabwe Gender Commission, what we've done is to ask or to work with the executive, meaning the ministries, and to get what we're calling a gender profile from each ministry, mm -hmm. including Ministry of Finance and Economic Development, mm -hmm. where we are saying we would want to be able to see the extent to which ministry staff, ministry parastatals, ministry agencies, are actually representing the gender dynamics or the gender equality perspective. Mm -hmm. Because if th if that is not going to be there, like I've already said, then the issue of unpaid care work is also not coming out. Mm -hmm. Just try and picture discussions around the economy. Mm -hmm. Just in general now in Zimbabwe, even if the media is covering issues around the economy, it's not always that that comes out as part of the economic discussions. So it is important that that is actually highlighted because by doing unpaid care work, it means that there is a contribution, and it has already been said, that we do to the gross domestic product. We are already con contributing something to ensuring that Zimbabwe continues to function. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times, as long as we are not recognizing that, it means even as we also talk about what we've done very well as a country, we will not recognize the efforts of those that, who, who were not formally doing work. So as the Zimbabwe Gender Commission, we monitor. We also have a thematic working group that looks at gender and the economy, where we are saying we want to be able to make the economy of Zimbabwe work for the women. And again, it goes back to that should start with recognizing the contribution that the women are already doing, not just in the informal economy, but also in the formal economy. We're also working with um, public and private institutions to also work with them on how they can start to mainstream the understanding of the different roles of men and women within the work that they do. And so that then, even as we, we are doing this work, and we were part of the, the stakeholders that Oxfam discussed with the issue of unpaid care work some years back, and we also gave the perspective of what does the constitution of Zimbabwe, for example, say, in terms of not just recognizing the contribution of women in work, but also recognizing the women's rights to economic empowerment, because the constitution does talk about economic empowerment. It also talks about ensuring that you don't have any people who end up working in situations that are most of servitude. Because again, some of the people who are doing unpaid care work work in such a situation that it's almost like being a slave. And unfortunately, our socialization is such that for a lot of the women, they will not think that this is not normal because you were taught that you wake up at four. I remember for me, when I was a small girl, we were being told that you wake up at four and you don't go to sleep until 10. And that whole time you're working. So even as Regis was saying that they will save the four hours, one of the things I definitely know is the, save, the four hours are not for them to just relax. I'll, and, I'll just, I'll just yeah. throw it to Regis because yeah. you mentioned that even they question later mm. but specifically it's very important that we do not um, ignore the girl child
RCA and the Household Care Survey, we did not include uh, the voice of Normally, they can speak out, but also we use what time they spent on their various actually engaging school authorities to actually say, let's share the extension of unpaid care work within the school system. Mm -hmm. So for example, traditionally it is the girls that sweep the classrooms mm -hmm. and the boys they go and pick the papers around, mm -hmm. you know, and do a bit of gardening. So we are saying when you create the duty roster, shall we have a roster that says this week is the boys, next week is the girls, but also begin to discuss the whole discourse around unpaid care work. Uh, we are also addressing other issues beyond just uh, the unpaid care work. For example, the question of menstrual hygiene. So if we put in a piped water scheme in most of the areas where that I talked about, uh, at least one school has benefited by having the piped water scheme scheme mm -hmm. passed through the schools. So we provide what I would call um, a dignity kit mm -hmm. where we have a bucket, some Vaseline, some, um, uh, some um, sanitary way so that if um, it is necessary for young girls to use that, the equipment is there, the sanitary towels are there. So we need to see unpaid care work be going just beyond the four hours but actually to say how do we address other issues that are connected um, to unpaid care work. So you cannot address sanitary needs if there isn't water that is readily what mm -hmm. available. Yeah. So that is what we are also trying to do. But we are also saying to the school authorities, can we have a position where the school are actually recognize that this is care work, but more importantly in terms of um, decision making that Virginia was talking about, it starts at the school level. We should be encouraging young girls to be doing things that they are not normally supposed to be doing so that they actually begin to look at sciences, they actually begin to think of what professions they can do rather than say, I just want to be a, a, a nurse, I just want to be a social worker. Those are noble professions, oh. but we are saying we should encourage them to be actually physicists, to be mathematicians, to do actual science. It starts there. That's and that uh, way, then that they become involved in decision-making positions. That actually brings me to my next question, because you are a social norms advisor. Mm -hmm. And uh, this discussion keeps referring to traditionally things were done mm -hmm. this way, traditionally things mm -hmm. were done this way. Do you feel that as a country and as an, uh, a community, we're there yet? Do you feel we're ready to, to, to shake off the stereotype, let go of what we've traditionally believed mm -hmm. all along, and just put everyone on an equal footing? Mm -hmm. I think we have... Uh, We have engaged the traditional leaders. And we do have some very progressive headmen, uh, chiefs, who are actually see the nobility and the possibility of actually sharing this work. So in that sense, we are on the road to do that, but social norm change takes over time. It's not something that can be done overnight. But one thing that is interesting is that when we work with uh, generations, you know, it is actually the young men who are most difficult to convince. Uh, they actually hold on to the what I'll call Chibaba syndrome. Dini senior, Dini Musha, Dini Mwendamberi, you know, and that everything has to be done for them. Whereas the chiefs, I don't know, or the older men, maybe it's because they've been in marriage or in a relationship for a long time, but they tend to actually embrace what we are discussing, particularly if we come through the chiefs, mm -hmm. particularly if we come through also the religious leaders, they tend to actually understand. You know, the Bible is a very interesting book. It can either be very subversive or it can be very oppressive. Mm -hmm. And when you get um, religious leaders that actually are talking about social justice, that are talking about gender equality, then we can begin to do that. But the one thing that I would want to add is that we can do as much 
social norms change work as possible, but it also needs to be what? To be assisted by policy changes. Mm -hmm. So we really need to see the Chief's Council coming out and say, as the collective of the Chief Council, this is what we believe can lead to what? To improved livelihoods, to improved relationships, to peaceful lives within the household. And because one thing that we must not forget is that this whole question of unpaid care work because of the social expert often leads to domestic violence, mm -hmm. intimate partner violence, because as men we expect that everything should be done for us. So you've, you've outlined how you've dealt with it in the rural setup, mm -hmm. but we still need a social norm change in the urban setting. Mm -hmm. How are you addressing this? Are you uh, approaching the, the, the councils? How are you dealing with it? Yes. One of the important things around the How I Care campaign is to actually look at who are the influencers we can use in urban areas. So we have worked very much with artists because um, that's one area where across the generation people tend to listen and tend to identify with certain artists and also sport. So we are um, working with the likes of uh, Baba Shupi, Madizi, Gaspi Warrior and um, uh, Shingika Ondera, the ex-footballer and Nelson Matongorero, the ex-national um, coach and currently the coach of Harare City. Over the next few weeks, we shall be flighting uh, videos that they've done around them explaining how COVID-19 has actually opened their eyes to this possibility of sharing work. But the other thing that's interesting is that with all these artists, particularly Gaspi Oria and Coach Matongorere and uh, Matsbaba Sakaria, we've actually asked them, Gaspi and his father, I hope you know that his father is Mechanic Manyeruke, and Gaspi son. So we're three generations and they're all talking around how unpaid care is taking place because culture is not statistic. It moves with time and it moves with generations. So it shows that we are on the way to do it but what we need is to combine not one solution works. We need to work on social norm change. We need to work on the reduction and the redistribution and we need to work on the, what, on the policy issues. So we want to engage the gender commission we want to engage the Minister of Power and Development to come up with easier renewable energy solutions. We want to engage the Minister of Water so that they put in more water, uh, piped water schemes in rural areas. They are not very expensive. At most they will cost 30, between 30,000 USD and 50,000. And I think we are in a position that if we plan and if we engage government and we talk about gender responsive budgeting, we should be able to over you know, time, over a couple of generations, be able to drastically reduce the amount of time that women spend fetching water, fetching firewood, and doing a lot of cooking. Okay, then uh, Veggie, I'll come to you. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that uh, Zimbabwe as a country has what it takes to undergo social norm change? Because we still have households here in urban areas where the woman has to go to work, do mm -hmm. the 8 to 5, go back home, start mm -hmm. cooking for the men who is sitting mm -hmm. while everyone was at work and they committed the same hours to the labor market. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that as Zimbabwe that there is a will or a willingness to accept social norm change? The willingness is there, and the fact that we have in this discussion today is one of those uh, indicators that something is changing. I think one of the things we need to, to be aware of is social change is not an event, but it's a transformation that takes a long time. And once you've been socialized into a certain behavior, even if you go to workshops or you are engaged or you are, I mean, we, you are educated, you're not going, there's some actions that you do without necessarily thinking about it. So as Regis was talking about policy, I just want to add to that whole discussion that you need to start with the women because currently they're the ones that are the gatekeepers for unpaid care work, for the housework. And one thing you'll see is that you need to be able to get the one woman to think before you allocate responsibilities to your boy child or to your girl child the way you were taught. So the policy dialogue, yes, will go to the ministries and whatnot, but it starts with the self, so the Zimbabweans themselves, to recognize that it does not make sense that somebody has been at work at, for eight hours, they come back, and then you still expect them to spend the next three hours preparing food. We do have people that will say, I will not eat food that has been prepared by somebody else. But my wife, I haven't had a woman who has said, I will not eat food that has not been prepared by my husband. But 
the, the will is there to the extent that our constitution has outlawed cultural and traditional behaviors that are adverse or that they actually call harmful cultural practices. And I know that when we say harmful cultural practices, a lot of the times we are thinking in terms of gender-based violence, the physical, the sexual, the psychological, oh, but we are also talking within, and if you also go even to the Anti-Domestic Violence Act of Zimbabwe, it recognizes economic abuse as one area where it's, it's actually seen as violence. And part of the economic abuse is you've got some people that will not be allowed to go and work. You've got somebody who went to university, not even university, who studied, qualified to do something, but they end up not being able to work because somebody says, and inam no shanda or you need to stay at home. So the will in terms of the legislative framework is there. Because in terms of our laws, it does say that, you know, we should be able to be seen as equal. Uh, the will is there even in terms of some institutions that have started to now work to change the norm. I think our greatest challenge is still in the mind, in the attitudes, in the behavior. And uh, this is where the cultural issues, and I'm happy that he's mentioning the traditional leaders because the cultural gatekeepers are the traditional leaders. So it's the culture, it's how each and every one of us thinks in your mind based on how you were socialized. That needs to change. Of course, uh, yeah. of course. But then doesn't that then come down to emancipation of the woman herself? Because yeah. it, it is my imagination that uh, if I were to get married and then yeah. somebody just came to me after seven, eight years of tertiary education, then yeah. they say, ah, my wife, you're not going to, you're not going to work. Yeah. It will probably hit uh, a certain, a certain nerve and I'll yeah. probably not agree to it, but not everyone is in a position to say no. So what yeah. is being done to empower the woman, to yeah. empower self so that yeah. women can resist such behaviors? Yeah. For your information, with that scenario you've just painted, with that scenario you've just painted, it actually accounts for some of the gender-based violence, the domestic violence that we get, where you find that once you, you are feeling that you're emancipated and you speak out, how that is dealt with, that conflict is dealt with, is that there is violence. So definitely... Should I continue? Okay, <laughs> so definitely there is... Emancipation has to be seen in terms of me being, not just me being aware of my rights as a person, me having been educated to be able to make my decisions or to make the right decisions for myself, but also in terms of the extent to which once I also make those decisions, am I going to find myself being violated or is it going to be recognized that I've made a decision? Because yes, you've been to school, you recognize that if you don't actually go out to work, your partner does not have capacity to be able to provide. Again, this is the other thing about socialization. Socialization has also told the men and the boys that you are the one who has responsibility to provide. So this does not quite account for the fact that it's not within their control to be able to provide. So it becomes a challenge. So we need to be able to have the awareness raising and then to also have the consciousness raising, meaning that once as a woman you recognize that you do have these rights or you are able to do this according to our constitution, then you also ask to be able to do it. And when you ask the environment, meaning starting from the household, okay, I'm getting distracted by your face. Should I continue? All right. Uh, what is emerging <laughs> right now is yeah. that uh, it, all, it's, it all starts from self and yeah. there is need for policy interventions yeah. so that some of these things that we're talking of can uh, happen. Mm. So I'll come to you, Regis. What are some of the policy recommendations or expectations that you have for government? Because in Uruguay, they've got a law that, uh, that sort of puts women on a safe pedestal where unpaid care work is concerned. So mm. they, they, there is actual legislation, tangible <laughs> legislation mm. that they can refer to when they go back home and somebody has got his feet on the sofa and he wants you to make the food after a whole day at, at, at work. What are some of the policy recommendations or expectations that you have for the Zimbabwean government mm -hmm. where unpaid care work is concerned? I think for me the most important one is the one that VG talked about, recognition. We really need government to recognize unpaid care work as care work is something that contributes to the, 
to the functionality of the economy and that contributes to the um, well-being of society. That is seen as a development issue, mm -hmm. that is seen as an economic issue. I think that's the first step. In practical terms, what does it mean then? It means that we have to look at legislation that will not only focus on individuals. Mm -hmm. If we talk of care work, let's see it as a care diamond where we have the state, that is responsibilities, the private sector, that is also responsibilities, ourselves as civil society of NGOs and also at the household level. So we would want then the state to be able to pass legislation that actually addresses the four R's. So, for example, one issue could be around um, shared uh, parental leave. We know that women go on maternity leave. Mm -hmm. There's been talk of paternity leave, but we have to educate the men first so that they understand that when we have parental leave, they have to actually contribute, do part of the redistribution when there's a new addition to the family. So that's an area where we think we can work around, around how we can have parental leave, not only just... Um, maternity leave for women and maybe five, ten days for, for, the, for, the for, for, the, for the father. That's one. Secondly, the question of energy. There's a lot that we can do around providing safe energy mm. that is readily available that then makes women not have to spend a lot of time looking for energy. Uh, that's another area where together with the Ministry of uh, Energy and Power Development, we can begin to look at that. The other area is around how the care economy contributes to the general economy. The time you serve them and also the contribution that women put to the economy ought to be recognized and be part of the national accounting mm -hmm. so that we can actually see the contribution that women are doing. All but right. also, Reggie, lastly... In the I'll just ask you to leave Virgie to give us her policy recommendation mm -hmm. before we close. Okay. okay. So in terms of policy recommendations, because unpaid care work uh, exists in the realm of social and gender relations, so we would say one of our recommendations is, is to say we need to up our recognition of gender equality and non-discrimination because this is the basis upon which people are socialized. We need to also ensure as a country that our policies, whether it's the socio-economic political policies, are the kind of policies that do not result in a lot of poverty at household level. Because when you have poverty, then it means a lot of the gap in service delivery falls to the household and within the household to the women and the men. We also need to be able, from a policy perspective, to ensure that women, men, and then even among them, you know, people with disabilities and whatnot are represented in structures that make decisions on behalf of the country. Because that way we'll be sure that unpaid care work will always be there, but it needs to be done in a way that is not unjust. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, so that was a very closing, just telling us that the country still needs to do a bit more than it is doing right now in terms of easing the burden of unpaid care work. The program is going to be back again tomorrow because there's still much to be said that has not been in exhausted today. You were watching uh, the Mint special. What has emerged in this show is that the year 2020 marking the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action was intended to be groundbreaking for gender equality. Instead, with the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, even the limited gains made in the past decades are at risk of being rolled back, specifically where unpaid care work is concerned, because the advent of the virus has increased the hours women and girls spend laboring in the proverbial trenches of unpaid care work. This broadcast was brought to you by Zim Papers TV Network and our partners Oxfam Zimbabwe. If you have any comments, views, on today's show, please contact us via our Facebook page, Zim Papers TV Network, or via our Twitter handle at ZTN News. May the Lord and your ancestors continue giving you abundantly.